Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhops Gaming Podcast, episode 80, February AMA, answering your questions live. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. It is the last Wednesday of February today, which means it is time for another AMA or Ask Us Anything, because it's not just me, it's two of us. Uh, in addition to answering your questions live, we've got a review of the Extermination Pack for Horizons. And some Gloomhaven, Medium, Gorus Maximus, and more Horizons in our Bellhops Tabletop segment. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming uh, discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. Our first comment comes from the YouTube version of our last podcast. Emmett O'Brien writes, I want your coffee mug, Mo. I had a similar one without the Imperial badge. That was my favorite, but it was dropped. Well, thanks, Emmett. Uh, it is a good mug. I, I don't know if people have noticed, but I actually try to use the same mug every Wednesday, every time we've recorded the podcast. And I get rather upset when it's not actually clean on Wednesday. And make sure not to use it on Mondays or Tuesdays so it's ready to go on Wednesday. Uh, this was actually a Christmas gift a couple years back. Uh, Deanna and the kids bought it when ThinkGeek had a clearance sale. I think it was close to when they were going out of business. Now, for those of you who not here live or listening on the podcast, it's a black mug with Star Wars in red on one side and the Empire symbol on the opposite side. Now, if you really do want one, Emmett, I did manage to find that on Amazon earlier today. So I'm going to show throw a link in the show notes to where people can get a copy of this mug. Well, Jess Nutt has a comment about our list of older games worth playing. Jess writes, all of the games on that list that I have played, about half, I can vouch for. So I have to assume all the ones I haven't are also good. Well, thanks for the comment, Jess. Uh, it's my list, so of course I think they're all great. But it's glad to hear that you sync up on the ones you have played. That's pretty cool. If you do get more played in the future, I'd love to know how it went. Well, Phil has a comment on our Big Trouble in Little China, Legacy of Lopan review. They write, I did the pre-order and got the deluxe gold box of so I had the expansion included. I have yet to play it, as I have not played the game with the same group of people twice. So I don't know if people would be capable of handling the new changes right off the bat. Does the white box version of the game not allow character advancement in the normal game? It does in the gold box version. So you can advance up in levels while playing the base game, not needing the legacy of Lopan to be able to use the levels. I've heard that the editing is poor, and I've come across a couple of instances of it in my plays, but overall, I just gloss over much of it and go with common sense when reading them. I do, however, agree that it is a bit steep on price to pick up the expansion. I'm glad I basically got it for free in the pre-order. Well, thanks for the comment, Phil. So first off, uh, don't be scared of Legacy of Lopan uh, to, to using it with new players. It is so different from the base game that it's basically like learning a whole new game. And if you're starting new people off with it, it should work fine because they won't have any preconceived notions or bias from the original game that would get in the way. Just start off right with that scenario. And I don't see any reason why not. We did that when we played it last time with people who hadn't played the original before. Now, as for the white box and leveling up, yeah, it's there. You can definitely level up in the main game and we've had it, but anytime I've played, it just doesn't happen enough, right? Like we never had anyone level up to level six like we did when playing Legacy of Lopan. Like if I remember the most we got was maybe two or three and then maybe once someone hit four, but never anyone hitting six. Whereas when we played through Legacy of Lopan, almost our entire group of six were up to six level by the end of it with at least one character that just kept flipping over the six level until all our cards were flipped over. 
Now, the last comment, though, that you mentioned there is, uh, well, about the editing, yes, you can overlook it, but man, it's frustrating. But that last comment where you noted that you are glad you got it for free, and I think that nails it on the head. Because as an add-on, as part of the Kickstarter and the deluxe edition of the game, I think it's an awesome expansion. Something bonus thrown in there that kind of mixes it up and changes up the base game, a new way to play. But as something you purchase separate at the retail level with such a high price point, I think it's too much money for too little game. Well, next we've got a two-player co-op suggestion from Kelly. Beyond's End plays well at two, but has a lot of content and replayability. Usually I'll play it at two players with one character each, but I've also done two players with two characters each. Thanks, Kelly. I have only personally tried Aeon's M with full four players. Uh, it's definitely a unique deck builder, both in the fact it's cooperative, and there aren't a lot of cooperative deck builders out there, and then the really cool mechanic where you never shuffle your deck, so the order you discard your cards in really matters. It's a neat game. It's a series I probably should dive back into, because I know they've done a lot of tweaks and fixes to the series. Like, I only got in on the first printing of the first game, and they put out a ton more, actually. I think a new Kickstarter just launched today for the latest season. It's something I've been interested in diving back in. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. Well, we start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell for the after show. All right, since tonight's a Q&A AMA episode, and it's going to be all about you fine folk in the lobby, we're just going to ask you to sit tight for just a moment because we're going to be right back in the next segment. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com where click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best ways for questions to get to us is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It's the last Wednesday of the month, and that means it's time for our end of the month AMA. Tonight, we're all about asking your, answering your questions live. I'll ask, yeah, okay. you'll answer. So... <laughs> Yeah, I was asking you questions. There's a totally, we'll, we'll mix that up one month, I think. We'll, we'll ask our chat room questions. We should do that one. That, that'd be an interesting twist on the AMA. It's, it's we ask you anything. Anyway, so here's your chance. Chat room, ask us anything you want, and we will answer you to the best of our knowledge. So, Ken Johnson asks, what do you use the bell for? All right, thanks for the question, Ken. This is the question I get asked the most often all over the place, on Instagram, on social media, when I share pictures online, but even when I show up in person with the bell with me and people show up to the local game store or even I brought it with me when I went to Origins and I was doing demos, I'd be like, do you mind? I'm going to put this on the table. Now, the bell exists for one simple reason, and that's branding. That's my bellhop call bell. It's a calling card. I try to make sure there's a bell in every picture I take. And I even bring it with me when I go gaming away from home. Like I said, I actually go, went to Origins and like while doing a demo for the game, I'm like, do you mind? And I put the bell on the table, then snap a picture. I personally think if people start thinking me as that guy with the bell, I'm doing something right. Absolutely. So uh, what do we have from the lobby tonight? What are people looking to know from the bellhop? quiet night tonight uh there's lots uh, of people talking they're just not know. asking questions I was talking about coffee and, and owning coffee mugs yes. uh so i'll dip into something from emmett o'brien who asks what are your rules for beverages on game night i have banned blue soda from my <laughs> games because for some mystical reason blue soda always gets knocked over blue soda do we even have blue soda here well, you that, used to, that... you used to, didn't you used to do Chaos Pop with blue, with one of the blue drinks? I don't remember uh, blue. Meyer? I remember red. Like, a, a, not my, a, uh, what is it? Fago. Does Fago have a blue? I'm sure Fago has a blue. They, Fago they has all the blue. colors. Yeah, it's true. Jones Soda at least has a blue. I find it amusing that it's just blue only. Um, basic oh, yes, rule Fago for beverages. Blue. Yeah, there you go. 
basic rule for beverages is not on the table. We use TV trays or I don't know what it was side tables, folding tables that you put out. Uh, they're actually lower than the main table, not higher because then stuff could still technically pull on. We put them in the corners of the table and we try to ask people to not have their beverages on the table. Now, I admit, sometimes we mess this up. <laughs> we try to do that, and we forget, and we put them on top, and we sometimes put the stuff right on the table. But the, the goal is to have no beverages actually on the game table where the components are. We're pretty good about it. We're not great. Where I'm really bad about it is at public play events. As I noticed last time, we were at CG Realm, and I spilled my coffee all over everything. So even then, I try to put it onto um, a chair or a side table um what we often do if we do get food at the cg realm at the windsor sandwich shop we have it delivered like the whoever's cooked it brings it out we'll put it on a different table than where we're playing at and then when people are eating they'll move over to that table to take bites or to eat or they'll just eat between games because we've talked about that in one previous episode i couldn't tell you how long ago now where we talked about uh i personally prefer to pause gaming to eat and then resume gaming not eat while gaming yeah, I know uh, the last time last time I was at the CG Realm, uh, when you spilled the coffee and we had to dive to re recover, yep. um, a lot of times what I was doing, uh, well, depending on the game, if you've got a game where it's turn-based and there's a, you know, a little bit of thinking time, I will like run over and grab a bite, you know, or, or lean over and yep. grab a bite at a different table uh, between, uh, but also that depends on whether you're not you're eating something messy or not, right? Yep. You don't want to be eating wings and have to clean your fingers every 30 seconds to move a piece or something. Uh, yeah. luckily, uh, the hot dogs there aren't generally that messy. Well, the Coney dogs can be. They can, they can be. They can be. Yes. Um, so then, uh, Deanna just reminded me of something. Easy mode's great for this. They yes. have these little metal t tr t tray tables that actually, they had them there the first time we went. And I was the one that was like, hey, can we steal some of those from, because they had them in the back by the, like, uh, for, by the TVs right, near Mario Kart or whatever they'd be playing. I'm like, can I steal these and bring these up front? Because one of the things is alcohol is served there. And beer is horrible for board games. Beer, I, I think beer may be as bad as, if not worse than Blue Pop, uh, especially if you're getting, uh, drinking the most popular beer there is a, a rather thick milk stout. And I don't want that on any of my game pieces ever, please. So they have these little metal tables that they'll put beside the table. So they work great. Right. Yeah, no, the, ta the tables there are nice because they, and they really are a good height too. Yeah, um, so. and they're nice down low. Like, even if you spill them, you're probably not going to get it on yourself or anything. So one of the problems I'm having is without being able to see you, I have no visual cues if you actually want to say anything. Uh, so I was just sharing some uh, some blue moon mist Fago in the chat room there. there there's a moon mist There's blue. a blue moon mist berry and a Fago cotton candy that are both blue All sodas. Right. They both sound terrible. Yeah, well. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that the blue soda would not go well with my digestive problems. I can't drink Fago Red Pop anymore for that problem, that reason. I don't know. The only thing I'd suggest is try to share your screen and come back. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, maybe, it, maybe it'll help. Um, hey, Danielle. Ask us a question, Danielle. Or have Owen ask us a question. I've got a question for Owen. Can I, can I, can we reverse it around? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know when he signed up at Breakout Con last year to do the 18xx thing, and there's like an intro to 18xx. And I know you were in there for six hours. Were you playing the same game that whole six hours? Because I want to know. It's it's scheduled for a three hour window. If I can actually go in, learn to play an 18xx only in that three hour window. Yes, yeah, I don't believe it. Go do something else. I don't believe that it will be in three hours, I, unless you walk out mid game. <laughs> like I, I don't, I don't want to walk out mid game, but I will. Like if the slot says three hours, and I plan something for that third hour to do something else, I'm gonna have to leave. For those not familiar, eighteen XX are a significant investment ah, game. See, single game for the six hours. See, yeah. Even though it's a, it says three hour window. I was I was really hoping that maybe he did the intro and then went on to play another 18xx. Well, I mean, they do have that room. That is the 18xx room. So, yeah. you know, they're able to do whatever they want in that room, essentially. Oh, wow. So, okay. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Oh, well, I was hoping. I am looking to, uh, I will probably be doing some demos of Gorinto at Breakout Con for anyone who's there. 
So uh, we have a question here from uh, Evil John, one of our patrons. Yes. Legacy games. Welcome serialized gameplay or overlong commitment that locks you out of other experiences. <laughs> That's a good way to word it. I like the way John worded that. Um, I personally really like legacy games, but not for either of those reasons. What I love about legacy games, and this could be any legacy game, one that doesn't require a campaign or an overly long commitment, is the permanency of your actions. And that is why any legacy game I play, I am going to destroy components. I'm going to rip up cards. I'm going to put down stickers. I'm going to write on the board. I'm not going to buy reusable stickers. I'm not going to sleeve everything. I am going to destroy that game as I play it because I love the fact that your actions have consequences in the game. That if I'm playing Seafall and I go to this island and I explore and there's some natives there and I decide to kill them, I'm going to mark the board that I killed them so that later bad things are going to happen to me for killing them. And that's a permanent thing that has happened in my game. And from then on, no one else can go to that place and get silk because I killed the natives that made the silk. But I get a constant supply of silk for the rest of the campaign. That's, that's, that is why I love legacy games. I love that impact that your actions have on the game. A good legacy game. Um, as for serialized gameplay... I don't know, it's the same as any other campaign game. I don't think it's any different than, say, playing an Imperial Assault campaign or playing Descent 2.0 or uh, I'm trying to think of good campaign games off the top of my head. We have an entire episode on good campaign games. Uh, not Paragon. <laughs> wow, my brain just completely went okay. away, too. <laughs> You're um, having that problem, too. All right. But, yeah, I don't, I personally, though, Risk I Legacy. Do... Risk Legacy, yeah. Uh, pandemic Risk... Legacy. Uh, yeah, those do require full groups. So, in a way, I, the overlong commit that locks you out of other experiences, I do have to say that is a thing. Um, actually, I think it's one of the questions that's in our chat room that, that if we get to it is, uh, did we put that one in there or not? Is what will the group do once you finish Gloomhaven? I don't see it in our show notes, but I know it was a question we got in uh, the Slack room. And one of the things is, there's all this other stuff I really want to try. Like, especially Clank Legacy looks fantastic, right? But we're still playing Gloomhaven. And right now, Gloomhaven's still fun. If it ever gets to the point, though it's not, we'll stop. Um, same thing with Risk Legacy. Risk Legacy, I never finished. Uh, that was due to the fact that the game group we had, one of the players, uh, I don't know how to word it, life situation changed. Uh, their, their work schedule, they finished school, got a job as a nurse. They had to deal with their, their significant other that, that she would stay at home until he got his degree and then he would stay at home or whatever it was. He was staying at home until he got his degree and then she was going to stop working and he was going to start or something, but whatever it was, you it, it's done, right? Like they, they, he was no longer available. Um, so that's just definitely it. So we, we still have fun playing Gloomhaven. So we're probably going to keep playing it, but we did give up on risk legacy pandemic legacy was tons of fun like we played through the whole thing and i hate pandemic and pandemic legacy we wanted to play the next week and we wanted to get done early so we could fit two night games in one night because that was the that was the goal was try to get in two games in one night and i don't know it's 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 a commitment but it's not like gloomhaven's different gloomhaven's like you're you're looking at 100 games before you finish like it's crazy and then you could still go back and keep playing it's almost a lifestyle game in that way but most campaign games like that most legacy games are like 10 to 12 games and that's not that big a deal i don't think like committing to play one game i played terraforming mars way more than 12 games and it's not serialized all right so uh we got a question from ryan thoughts on uh final uh ffg's policy change on replacement components and their uh discontinuing of RPG game development. So there's really two questions there, but yeah, it's two questions. So Asmodee, it's actually Asmodee's policy. Asmodee is a publicly traded company and as a publicly trading company, they are beholden to their stockholders and their stockholders looked at a balance sheet and went, we are spending way too much money on replacement components for our games. So what they have decided is we're not going to replace components anymore. So if you buy an Asmodee game, and Asmodee owns almost all the major publishers, so Fancy Flight Games, Flat Hat Games, like, to be honest, Sean could probably pull up a list while I'm talking here. Yeah, but Fancy they Flight, own... Days of Wonder, uh, Gigamic, Timon, Aiello, uh, Lillibud, Hasbro. Um, yeah, well, yeah. they don't own Hasbro. Oh, no, sorry. Hasbro should be on there. <laughs> that, that's a different company. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a huge 
chunk of the board game industry is owned by them, and they're no longer replacing components. What they want you to do is go back to your retail location and return the game, and then the retail store is supposed to do that. I don't know. I haven't talked to the local store owners, but I can't see them being happy about this. I know as a purchaser of games, I'm not happy about this. I've often gotten replacement components. I, it's the, There are people involved. There are humans involved in putting these games together and mistakes get made. It's going to happen. You're going to get a miniature missing an arm. You're going to get doubles of a punch board. You're going to be missing cards. That kind of stuff happens. And I personally think that that's part of the cost of doing business as a game, board game publisher, that they should replace them. Uh, so I, I think it's a terrible decision. They're going to lose a lot of fans. But it's possible that Asmodee is now big enough they can't fail. That they, they, they own enough market share. Fantasy Flight's popular enough. It's it just like every time someone calls for a boycott of Games Workshop, they keep trugging on. And the fans are still fans, and the fans keep buying. So I, I overall, people are pissed off. I'm not happy about it. I think it's a terrible business decision. They're going to lose some market share over this. People are the, the pissed off people aren't going to buy the games. Uh, what we're waiting to see is a really big blow up. Right. Like, are you going to have like an automotive recall notice when like every copy of a game's missing something? Like, what do they do then? Well, whereas before. Go ahead. So the problem I see is and I saw this really, uh, really well framed up. And, I, and unfortunately, it was quite a while ago now. So I don't remember who on Twitter. But uh, this person asked their wife and said, who wasn't a gamer and said, yep. so if you buy something from the store and it's not complete, what do you do? And their immediate response was yeah, bring it back. I bring store. it back to the store. Uh, in general, products you purchase, you bring back to the store unless they are that special kind of pro uh, product, which has the big notice when you open up the box saying, in case of flaws, do not bring this back to the store True. because they have a service depot. And that's usually in, in general purchasing, you have the companies that have service depots like your Maytags and all things like that, or you have things that bring back to the store. Uh, and that normally, and again, this is, you know, outside of the, the board game retail market, stores will generally have supplies. And so you bring it back. It's wrong. They give you another one off the shelf, take the old one back, and they deal with the returns to the company. The problem that we're seeing here, and the reason why I think this is a bigger problem, is the, the fact that board games are a small purchase. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, these board game stores aren't keeping enough stock to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm right. I go buy the game from whatever local game store and I bring it home and it's missing a component. I go back and I'm like, can I replace this? And it's wingspan. Right. And I'm, they're like, oh, sorry, we don't have any replacement copies. Oh, can you get one in? Oh, they're out of print right now. It's between print runs, right? Like you just don't have that, that economy of scale that you do with mass market products. No, and I, and I mean, I'm seeing complaints. I'm seeing problems with like people talking about uh, a lot of the like the final the Final Fantasy uh, Star Wars components. It's like, hey, I bought this and my miniature's broken, so I have to bring it back to the store, and eventually they'll get a new one in for me. Um. Yeah, I, I said I'm not happy about it. I, we'll see how it plays out. I I don't know. Like, are that many people complaining? Like, it's it's pretty much an industry standard that companies do this, and it should be baked into their budgets. Right. Like, I don't think any other companies are going to start doing this. It's, like I said, it's a board of directors that sat there, saw a number on a spreadsheet, and we're like, whoa, what the heck is this? Why are we doing this? Probably with the same argument as the husband and wife going, well, no one else does that. Why are we allowing this? Well, and it's, it's interesting. And uh, Anshi Games is bringing up a good point in the chat room. You know, to get an additional piece, you're going to end up trashing the entire mm -hmm. game. And I think what needs to happen is they need to tighten up their manufacturing. Well, uh, there's that. And, and, and if, if this starts happening, you start seeing a lot of waste of because of bad product, bad packaging and things like that, then that board is going to attack other ends of the uh, of the manufacturing problem. So see what if, if, what you, if they seen... see loss, you know, if loss is in their budget, that's going to be addressed. Now, what I've seen retailers say is send me an extra copy. So every time if I order a crate of 10 games, send me 11. And that 11th one, I'm going to open up for components for people who come in with broken bits, which I think makes sense. Yep. Right? That, that way, you're, you're not, it's not trashed because you're going to bring it in and go, I'm missing this. They're not going to take the game back. They're going to give you that bit. 
Now, this is the part of it that I don't know all the details of. From what I understand, retailers are still going to be able to get replacement pieces from Asmodee. So it's going to be a matter of you go to the store and complain, and then the store gives you a new copy, and then to sell that copy that was returned, they then contact Asmodee to get the bit. But then they're selling an open game. So I don't I don't know that side of it. I, I don't work at a local game store. I have friends that own a local game store, and I might be able to get some info about it. But it's not something I know I, I can I have an answer for. Yeah. So um, I'm just looking at the FAQ from uh, Asmodee right now. Um you know, I bought my game at a big box store, return it to the, uh, and follow their policies. Um, if you buy it from Asmodee, visit the web store and use the contact us. Uh, if you buy it secondhand, check before well, you buy. Buyer beware. Yeah, I was going to say, you're SOL for that. Yeah. There, there are a lot of entitled gamers that seem to think that if their cat eats a piece, that the company should replace it. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I, if it comes defective from the manufacturer. The problem? And yes, there are a lot of publishers for years who have replaced cat-eaten pieces and I ripped yeah. the card and whatever, and it's awesome that they do, but you shouldn't expect it. Yeah, and one of the problems, and then there's the what they state on their FAQ, and it's a realistic problem, is because of the size of Asmodee now, they have grown yeah. to a point where the ability to keep a warehouse full of all the potential components... I mean, that's insane. Uh, you know, if they were well, able to fair. get into a print-on-demand sort of thing, but the warehousing costs to well, keep how is it, fair how is it of worse now? How is it worse now that they're a bigger company? All these individual companies used to do it. Well, I don't yeah. see how it's worse now that they're they're so big. That doesn't make sense to me. Oh, it does. It, it Because now it's a, it's a warehouse of spare parts rather than, you know, this little game company had, you know, the back room that they kept a bunch of stuff in and, you know. Yeah, but when they bought these places out, they literally just changed the ownership they didn't close other stores like these little places still exist why wouldn't plaid hats still keep plaid hats pieces and indie boards and cards keep their stuff and well because as modi as the as the parent company is responsible for it. yeah but then they, they bought it yeah i guess but then they should just be able to tell uh the company to send it they're like hey plaid hat you're missing a piece send it out yeah I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it, and, and, and again, we don't know all the yeah, contract contractual not. agreements between all the different parts. But, uh, but yeah, uh, overall, I, it's 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 definitely a new twist for the board game industry. We'll see if other publishers follow suit. I don't actually know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting because I mean the the concept is. Um, it's going to be, and, and, and she games is saying by that argument, they don't have the ability to ship pieces to retailers. Yeah. And I don't see any mention of them shipping pieces to retailers. So they may actually just be shipping extra games. Yes. Yeah. I saw something about as pieces retailers but, being able to then recoup the cost, right? Cause then the right. retailer can't, is stuck with a broken game. There was some discussion on that on one of the, the face private Facebook groups for yeah, industry insiders. For, for retailers, they specifically say, contact your sales rep directly, and they don't yeah, like, publish that, that information. Exactly, it's, it's not published. So yeah. I have a bit of insider that there's a way to do it, but yeah. I don't know. It, it's a, it's, I think it's going to be a mess. Uh, like I said, where I think we'll see it blow up is when the expansion for Outer Rim, Star Wars Outer Rim, every copy's missing the X-Wing card, right? And then what do they do? Like, when you have a recall, like I said, in the auto industry, they we're going to burn all those copies and resend them out. Like, I don't know. It's it, And like Asmodee is so big. At it. Z-Man Games is Asmodee. Like, it's it's a huge portion of the market. Uh, well, I mean, and part of the problem, again, is the fact that we're just used to it, right? I mean, I remember back oh, in yeah. the 80s, you know, if you bought a copy of, you know, a Hasbro game and there was a missing piece, there was usually you a phone number you sellers. called. No, there was a phone number you called in the yeah. box. Um, and they would often mail you a part. Um, it has been part of the board game industry for mm. a very long time, for for better or worse. Um, I'm not, I don't really know if there's a a good or a bad. Uh, it is just that is the way that industry has been, and we're used to it. You and know what I would love to see is, some companies do this, is what they should be doing to counteract this is give you extras of stuff. So that if something is missing or something does break, you have extras. Now, some companies are great for this, right? Like uh, Eagle Griffin, I think, is one of the ones where, like, Lisboa, they gave you an extra copy of every token. Like, yeah, you can only lose one, but you can lose one and still play the game. Yep. Like an extra punch board, whatever. I think it would be great. Yep. 
No, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's 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 money. You know, we are in a well, yeah. You know, then especially now that we have you know thousands of games coming out, the market is swamped. Margins are becoming thinner because you're forced to compete against Kickstarter, where some people are probably losing their shirts to put out a game. Uh, Although Asmodee's not. Math. Asmodee's not really competing with Kickstarter when most of their companies are publishing through Kickstarter. True, but I mean there are, but there are still other games being. Yes. I mean, you know, yes, Asmodee yeah. is a, is a is a huge part of it, but uh, yeah. the fact that they are all of it, and so the margins are still getting driven down. And I think yeah. Asmodee would like to try and change that. Um, yeah, overall, this is one of the big changes we're going to see in the industry. Is a lot less games coming out. We, the, it, I'm not going to say the bubble has burst because I don't know if I believe in the whole board game bubble theory in the first place. But we're not going to see another year where 9,000 games come out at once. That was two years ago. Last year was only 5,000. It's going to be even less this year. Uh, for example, Stefan Feld has said, I'm not putting out another game until next year. It's just the market is too flooded. No one can play all the games anymore. And great games are getting missed because there's just so much. There's just too much. It's like, and it's the same thing that's happened to other industries, right? Like no one listens to all the music. No one watches all the movies. No one reads all the books. No one plays all the games anymore. It's it's yep. not going to happen. And we're never going to get to the point again where you probably can play all the games, but it should adjust to a more reasonable level in the next couple of years, I think. And and part of the problem, I think, is, um, you know, with, a TV, with TV shows and movies, you watch them once and move on. Whereas mm -hmm. board games are designed to be experiences that the experience over and over again so you you can have more tv shows and more movies and more books out there because you you can burn through them yep. uh, whereas a game you're not supposed to burn through that you're supposed to say, yeah. you know come back to it maybe not every week but over and over again not just that isn't one and done that is another change we've seen though is people designing games to be good for the one and done because some people do consume board games that way now yep and Designers realize that and publishers realize that. Well, and unfortunately, I, I have to say that a lot of the review market, and I'm proudly saying not our review market, uh, <laughs> you know, we aren't pushing the hot new stuff. Uh, we're pushing, you know, whatever. Whatever and, I've been playing that's fun. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we're, we're pushing the fun games, not the newest games. Whereas some of these reviewers are always just craving that next new thing uh, you know, I see. Tw I saw Twitter blow up the other day about some of the new games coming from um, our favorite, our favorite design studio. Yeah. Um, and you know Prospero. the new Wonder Woman, and you know all these new Prospero Hall games that aren't out yet and aren't going to be coming out yet. But the review copies are already out, so they're driving this market for something that isn't even going to be out for six months. Yeah. Uh, and that's you know troubling. And again, yeah, like Deanna is pointing out, we said this during our last episode where we talked about games from pre-2000. We're not saying new games aren't good. Yeah. <laughs> We're not saying that they're on a downward spiral and all new games are crap, but there are definitely some good old games as well. Yep. John, John's got another potential topic there for us. How perishable. No, that's a good one. Yeah. I, that, that's, not a, that's not an AMA topic, though. That's an yeah. episode topic, I think. But to be honest, the, the industry is running that way. So when we had Daniel Zayas on the show, this is one of our early um, interview episodes. That was his belief, was that the board game industry, tabletop gaming, is becoming more like Hollywood, where you're going to go on out, you're going to try the game, you're going to enjoy the game, you're going to talk about the game, everyone's going to talk about the game, and then move on to the next one. The rare game, you're going to want to bring home. And that is he expected a big change in the industry that way. And that ties into the popularity of things like board game cafes, which are popping up everywhere, where you don't need to own all the games. You go to the board game cafe, you try Wingspan, you're like, wow, Wingspan was a lot of fun. If you really liked it, you buy the DVD and bring it home, right? The same way people consume movies. If you don't really like it, maybe you go back to the theater and see it again. You go back to the game store or you go back to the co coffee shop or whatever it is, the board game cafe, and you play Wingspan three months from now with your significant other again, and then you leave. And you don't feel bad for not owning Wingspan. You can always go play it at that place later, yeah. no, I which think, I, I can I, see. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, I think we're, we're moving quickly to that if and only if the board game cafe market manages to stay strong. Um, yeah. And now I think that's going to require some things. I think that's going to require some FLGSs sort of pivoting a little bit into more of a cafe uh, situation where they can provide that, that sort of experience where you can play at the FLGS and buy. 
Uh, otherwise, they may end up running into competition from the cafes where maybe you don't go for a game. Maybe you're just there for it because it's good food. Um, yeah. Or you can do the, go there for the game um, and have some coffee. You need to sort of uh, balance that. And, and depending on the market is whether or not the FLGSs are going to feel the pressure from the cafes or not, I think is a lot of it. The problem with that is as a local game store, you need to start charging people to play your games for that to be viable. And as a local game store, you probably never have charged people to play your demo games. So that's a culture change, right? That's getting people to start paying to use the tables in stores you never had to pay before if they're going to compete with a cafe. Well, yes and no, because there are other ways. I mean, you look at stuff, you, you look at, uh, you know, and again, I'm going to use the CG ROM, for example, you know, they've got the restaurant component. So if they can bring you in for free and, and hook you on, you know, the secondary charges, you know, that's, that's what yeah. they need to work on is you don't, because they're an FLGS, they, maybe they don't charge for the table, but they find other ways to upsell basically uh, yeah. and, and help cover the costs. I think it'd be difficult because not every game cafe that I've ever seen that I've been in does charge. So like for playing the games in some way or right. another, like I, we got dinged with that the first time we went to a local Windsor one where we brought our own game and they wanted to charge us to play our game. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> all right. I will just walk down the street and go play for free. Thanks. Cause I'm used to being able to play for free, especially if I, I can see if I'm going to use your game, I might want to pay, but if I'm bringing my own, but yeah. that's part of that, industry right that's yeah. that's part of the thing interesting side note that i did not know until today snakes and lattes is a publicly traded company i had no clue you can buy yeah. stock in snakes and latte yeah they're uh they're a big deal they just changed their name to f-u-n-n -N is their stock market oh, really i don't yeah i don't know which market they're on probably toronto i would assume but interesting yeah i um, did not know that so let's just jump back into Ryan's question again. We'll get back into uh, into Asmo D. Uh, what about the eventual discontinuing uh, of RPG game development for FFG? You know what? That one I almost don't want to comment on because there's just all these unsubstantiated rumors right now. So supposedly someone put out an article saying they like first they they did fire their development team. But that doesn't mean anything in the RPG industry because almost every company nowadays uses freelancers. Like Wizards of the Coast, the last time I looked it up, had eight employees. That's it. Like, it's crazy how small these companies... Like, the company that makes D&D, &D, right, is like eight employees because they contract everything. They don't need employees that work for them. They just need contractors to write stuff. And from what I could tell, Fantasy Flight got rid of the development team because they were switching to this model. Now, recently, in the last week or so, someone put out an article, and I can't remember who it was. It was one of the bigger online media sources for Geek News, that the games were dead. No more Genesis, no more Star Wars, no more Tyranoth, and whatever RPG series are all dead. But then I saw a counter article that said that was not true, that someone was just extrapolating some news that wasn't necessarily true, right? Like, that they, they aren't killing it. So I don't actually know if they're killing RPG game development or if they're outsourcing it. And I don't really want to comment because I don't know what the actual answer is. All I can say is I really like their games. Like, I, I love that narrative dice system. And I, I dig the work they've done. And I think it kind of stinks that they may be stopping. But I can see why. Like, Fantasy Flight's a, a board game company. And again, they're owned by Asmodee, which is a publicly traded company. And someone's probably looking at profit margins and going, what's with the Star Wars RPG compared to X-Wing? Because X-Wing's their big money maker, the prince of the money. And they're looking at X-Wing figures, and they're looking at Star Wars Edge of the Empire figures going, these don't balance out. Why are we doing this second thing? So it, if they're killing it, it sucks. Uh, they're good games. But to be honest, they put out content, in my opinion, way too quickly. I can't keep up with the games. Even when I had a very well-paying job, I couldn't keep up with the schedule from flight. What I would love to see is them just cutting back, keeping the games and putting out whatever, two to four modules a year, two to four splat books, just enough to keep the game going and keep it interesting for people who are are keeping up. But none of the like splat book every month and a deck of cards every other month and new maps every month. Like it's just, it's way too much to keep track of. So uh, I'm looking at a statement from Fantasy Flight Games right now. Um, they declined commenting on the Final Fantasy Interactive shutdown or the layoffs, but did confirm that all four of the announced RPG products uh, are continuing 
and that all three product lines are ongoing. See, that's what I thought. That's the that's what I had seen, but I didn't want to say it officially. Yeah, so so that, that is directly some off news there. media. Yeah, some news media site ran with the fact that they did get rid of their development team. That is true. They laid off their development team, but that doesn't mean anything in the RPG industry. Very few RPG companies have in-house writers nowadays. Yeah, no, it's going to be freelance, which I have to say is another problem um, because uh, the gig economy is not sustainable in the long term. Uh, we have Kickstarter employees now unionizing. Uh, one of the food delivery services in Toronto has just won a court case allowing uh, unionization of their delivery employees. Um, the gig economy is in trouble, uh, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, yeah. It's going to mean a lot of changes. It's going to mean a restructuring of how we think things cost because prices are going to go up. But what you're going to get for that and what employees are going to get for that, I think is probably going to win out in the end. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, Jeff uh, has asked us, what do you think... Print, or do you think print and play games will take off more than they have if we're moving towards that perishable game concept? I I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know what it is, but people just have an aversion to print and play games. They they want physical. They want something. They want to have it in their hands. Uh, there's definitely a, a subset of gamers who are all about it, all about cheap gaming, print and play, um, and all that. But I think overall. I don't know. I don't think print and play is really ever going to take off. I don't, possibly, like I know some people do it. But well, you don't. Um, you are not a, a print and play. No, at all. No, I'm not. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I can't explain it. It's the same reason I, I hate reading PDFs. I want a physical book. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know why. But no, I'm not a big fan. But I think it's even worse in a way. Like a print and play game. If I'm only going to play once, I don't want to waste the time to put it together. Right, like depending on the game, if you're talking about an RPG, it's probably print a PDF or download a PDF. But if I'm doing a print and play board game, and there are lots out of there, I'm printing boards and I'm mounting things and I'm grabbing chips and chits from other games and I'm finding my dice and I'm putting it all together. And I'm probably spending way more time putting everything together than I am going to be playing it. And if I only play that once, that, yeah. that's going to be terrible. I'm like, man, I wasted all this time to only play this game once. Uh, like I said, I, I, I don't think so. I, I like, I don't know, I like physical things. It's, it's, I'm sure it's a culture thing. It's how I grew up. I, I have, it feels ephemeral if I don't have that thing in my hand. And like Neil, my friend Neil is all about print and playing stuff for his games. Like he will sit there. If he, he'll he'll try to buy a game. Like he will do his his dand darndest to get this game some Chinese developer made that plays seven players and seven players only, and it's supposed to be amazing and recreate some period of time that I have nothing no nothing about. And if he can't get the company to send him a copy, he'll sit there and literally build the game himself he'll go online and he'll screenshot the the board and he'll print it off and he'll mount it and it'll look amazing that's how i played wallenstein the first time it was basically like this print and play copy that he had cuddled together from all these different german components that's what he loves but we played that way more than once and the games he spends the time doing on he's playing like 30 40 50 times because that's how he consumes games and I, i've talked about neil before he has a gaming library of about five games and that's it and he rotates them out they play those same five games all the time every saturday two to six games a night on saturdays and then they get sick of it and he sells it and he gets a new game and then they play that game for so long it's a very different way to do it. It's not the um, perishable gaming at all. Oh, no. They play the heck out of a game. Oh, yeah. They they use their games up. <laughs> oh, they do. They really do. And they do every little expansion, every house rule. They try every variant. They get the game designer on the phone while they're playing. Like, they took take it very seriously, which is probably, in a way, kind of cool. It's just very different than how I consume games. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, Ryan, Ryan does point out there is there is a potential that some places – where shipping is just ridiculous. Maybe yeah. print and play becomes more reasonable. Like I know a lot of things shipping to, uh, you know, the Pacific Australia. Rim, going down to Australia and stuff like that. They pay through the nose for shipping yeah. a lot of times, depending on how the company arranges shipping. Uh, and so maybe for them, if they're going to spend 45 bucks on shipping a $40 game, maybe printing it out and spending an hour or two is worth it. Yeah. No, very true. Very true. I could see that. So I'm going to grab the question we had from our Discord, if I can find it here. Where is... Oh, I don't have our Discord open. Uh, I think it came from Math Guy Dave. 
who asked, what is your plans for the Gloomhaven group when you're done? I'm paraphrasing because I don't, I thought it I had is, Discord uh, open. What's next for Friday night group after Gloomhaven? All right. For one, at this rate, we started in September 2018. I, it doesn't feel like Gloomhaven's ever going to end. So I, I, I think that's, we'll just be playing that forever. Uh, <laughs> I really do. It's, it's feeling like that. Uh, maybe we should rush and try to get to the uh, the end of Gloomhaven because yes, I saw Evil Jayon in the chat noted that he didn't know you could finish it. Technically, you can. You can finish the story. There is an end. There is an overarching plot that you can complete. There is an expansion out that adds more to that plot, um, and then it's done. After that expansion, Gloomhaven is done. Uh, this year, soon, uh, the preview is up right now on Kickstarter. You can look at Frosthaven, which is the next big. Gloomhaven game from Isaac Childress um, and Cephala Fair Games. It's there. Um, but I think if we do finish it, I'm going to take a break from Gloomhaven. I really would like to, we'll probably stick with that group because this group actually started as a Pandemic Legacy group. Like right? playing with Tori and Kat started off with me buying a copy of Pandemic Legacy and trying to find a group to play through that campaign and started with the most we will play is 24 games. The average game is probably about 16 to 18. And they're like, sure, we'll sign up. And this is before we live streamed or anything like that. So I, I have a feeling that group will always be a legacy group. We'll play something campaign. Personally, right now, I would like to play Clank Legacy. Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated looks fantastic. I love deck builders. I love Clank. I first shied away from it because I know nothing about um, Acquisitions Incorporated. Like, I know it's a comic book from Penny Arcade, and it somehow commercializes D&D and your adventuring party, which actually sounds like something I used to do in AD&D 2nd Edition years ago. It sounds very much like the Obsidian Fist now that I've dug into it a bit more. And I don't like the art style, but so I kind of shied away from it, but I've heard so many good reviews that it's just Clank, where you have an evolving master deck, and your personal deck evolves, and you're putting stuff on the map. Like, it looks really good. So um, Clank Legacy is probably the one I would like to move to. But like right now, that's the hot game. By the time we actually finish Gloomhaven, who knows what the, the hot Legacy game will be. Part of me wants to play Pandemic Legacy Season 2 just for a sense of completeness. But I've heard it wasn't as good as 1. And while 1 was pretty good, we um, it ended badly. Like our personal campaign ended on a sour note. And I've heard it's not as good. And I'm like, well, if it's worse than that, do I really want to play pandemic legacy season two yeah no i pandemic Le legacy just left a very sour taste in your guys mouth with uh the way the oh, way just... it all sort of played out and, and and choice the way the way choices were kind of made and 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 disappointing i don't want to spoil anything obviously uh for anyone who does enjoy yeah. it but uh yeah it's interesting Oh, there you go. Evil John Lake Pandemic Season 2 better. I don't know. I, there, there's just other stuff since then that's come out. Yep. So I don't I don't know if we do that. I really want to go buy another copy of Risk Legacy and play through that because we didn't finish the first time. But I don't think it'd be with that group. I think I'd find a new group to play it. Uh, Angie Games is saying Lord of the Rings. <laughs> or uh, the, the problem is Tori and Kat are already playing it. That's so true, they're yeah. not going to play it with us. They've already got a campaign of that going. But yeah, I want to play Lord of the Rings Journeys in the Dark, but that'd be a different group. Yes, and Deanna wants to play Seafall, but I, th I think we need to buy another copy of Seafall and start over with a different group. Uh, yeah, there's <laughs> the, yeah, the new... Uh, uh, Ryan points out there's the new uh, Scooby-Doo Mystery Mansion Betrayal at the House on the Hill retheme. Thoughts? I I hate Betrayal at House on the Hill, so I'm not going to pick up a Scooby-Doo version or a D and D version or a sci-fi version or anything else that says Betrayal at Ho at Betrayal Legacy. You know what? To be honest, Betrayal Legacy. I've heard some good things on that. Slightly tempting, but again, I like legacy games. I like that permanent. So uh, that slightly appeals, but I have not. I have had really, really bad experiences with Betrayal at House on the Hill, and the bad experiences outweigh the good ones. So it's it's the opposite of fallout i've talked about before right. how like 25 percent of games of fallout it's like someone has no chance of winning but the good ones the good the other 75 percent are so much fun that i'll still play the game where betrayal is like the other way around like 75 percent of the time the game was bad and the 25 percent of the time when it was good didn't make up for those bad experiences right. and just sitting down to play knowing that i could have one of those bad experiences i don't even want to take the chance 
uh, we got some people in there. We've got ten more sessions for betrayal. Uh, we've got folks who uh, who finished betrayal. Um, so I've heard betrayal legacy is better. I don't know. So yeah, no, it's hard to say. Angie Games was enjoying Seafall, but I think we've talked in the past about uh, the issues that caused that uh, that to end. Yeah, there are problem with Seafall was nothing wrong with the game. Yeah, it's it was... it is a very unique game. And you have to be willing to do kind of the same things over and over again. Because every game you basically start from scratch, which is kind of weird in a legacy game. And yes, you get little minor improvements, but it's like, oh, I'm going out to go to the islands again. And I'm going to go do the thing again. And I'm going to deliver this good again. And then I'm going to get my engine going. And then maybe we'll unlock something new. And then it'll add a little bit more. Like, it's 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 a very unique game. The problem we had was one of the players was falling behind. And despite the fact that we tried to assure them that there's different parts of the game, and there's, I guess there's like, here the slight spoilers, there's like three chapters of the game, and different strategies work better in different chapters, and there's a catch-up mechanic, and everything I've read online is like, if you're falling behind in the first part, don't worry, but he wasn't willing to go that right. far, so... Uh, there we go. Uh, Brian wants to know, would you convert the Gloomhaven group to a full RPG group? No, no, that's a board game group. Like I said, we play legacy games. Not that I'm adverse to playing RPGs with Tori and Cap, but Friday night wouldn't be. No, I, I should, I technically have an RPG group that gets together on Mondays sometimes. And, sometimes. you know, once in a while. In the last three years, I think we've got together once. Um, no, hey, we made your DCC character. We did. We made DCC characters. And we, we didn't play Monday, but that was partly my fault. Um, like, I think role-playing with Cat and Tori would be great, but that group's a group that we play legacy games, and I think we'll keep doing that on Friday nights. Like, that that particular group, it's working, right? Yeah. Like, put it this way, Deanna hates co-op games, and we've had her play in a co-op game since 2017, <laughs> every Friday, pretty much, right? Like, we even had her play Betrayal, or, uh, Big Trouble in Little China one week. So And you got her having I fun don't... playing Medium. Yes, yes. But like I, I don't know that group just jealous. Like we, I, I even got her to say the game is a pretty good game once, which is a pure co-op. So I don't think so. I don't think that group will ever jump over to RPGs. Though I hear about Tori and Cat talking about their D and D sessions, and I kind of like, oh god, you should play under me sometime. But like maybe if I got a group going, I'd be I'd invite them to join <laughs> at some point. Uh, uh, what have we got here? Uh, have you ever played any of the collector card games? The collector, are you talking like Magic the Gathering? Is that what we're looking at? Collectible card games? If that is the question, then back in the mm -hmm. 90s, I think I played all of them at least once. That was at least my goal. Uh, at that time in my life, I had disposable income from a unique source. I was selling off my old toys, and I was selling them to a place in Detroit called the Classic Comic and Movie Center that was giving me book prices for uh, Star Wars and Transformers. And I was converting that into store credit and by converting it into store credit, I would buy whatever they had. So they had an RPG selection. So that's an awful lot of where my vampire, because at that time period, I was running Vampire the Masquerade for 17 players. Sean was even in that game. He played a Nosferatu called Info. Don't ask me why I remember that. I don't remember what Deke was playing, but <laughs> I remember your Nosferatu. Because I almost never played Nosferatu. I normally played Malkavs. Yeah, no, you were the Nosferatu, yeah. and you used to set at the, the wrestling video game. Yep. And play, yeah, no, play I, I, no I, yep. I remember it was that was my cyberpunk vampire character basically. Yep, yeah, you had the hacker, but yes, um, so I, I that's where I got almost all my vampire books. Uh, that's also where I got a large collection of my novels, fantasy novels. I, at the time, I was into the uh, Thomas Covenant series. I can't remember what the the tales of Thomas Covenant. That was where those came from. That's also when I started collecting Spawn action figures because I was getting so much credit, I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, so I started buying all the CCGs. So I tried Heresy. I tried Mech Warrior. I tried Netrunner. I tried uh, Magic, of course. Magic we got into beforehand. Magic's got an interesting story. I don't know if I'm going to tell it now or not with Richard Garfield being in Windsor and me running Warhammer. Magic we got into previous to that. Um, Wyvern. Uh, the D&D &D dice game, whatever that was called. I'm drawing a blank on the name of that one. Wasn't it just Dungeon Dice? No, that doesn't sound right. Dragon Dice. Dragon, Dragon Dice, Dice, that's it. Yeah. So Dragon Dice, uh, Spellfire, Star Wars. Uh, the Star Wars where the one side was light side, one was the dark side. The, the uh, Decipher Star Trek game. Um, I'm still Overpower. 
uh, Rage, uh, Arcadia, the Wild Hunt, um, oh, like like all of them, like like the uh, the BattleTech, yes, BattleTech, the trading card game I tried, uh, Dune, although I only had two decks, the Knights of the Dinner Table trading card game, Illuminati, um, again, I'm, jeez, like basically we we tried all of them, like we tried every single possible ccg that came out in the time of all of them wing commander galactic empires galactic empires is actually one of my favorites i love galactic empires my second favorite was middle earth the wizards uh specifically just the wizards not when you played the minions or you played the nazgul middle earth was actually the best one too yeah yeah welcome to the mo listing ccg show thank you <laughs> yes i played all the ccgs at some point Magic the Gathering was was by far one of the best. Lord of the Rings, the Wizard, or Middle Earth, the Wizards, was was probably second. The Decipher Star Wars was Deanna's favorite. I also enjoyed that one. And uh, Galactic Empires was one of my favorites. I really liked Galactic Empires, but no one else played it. Jihad, it's another one. I'm sure there's probably more. <laughs> uh, all right. Moving on, uh, thoughts about the new uh, version of Masquerade, now by Modifius. I have not gone back to Vampire since those early days. The last time I ran Vampire was for that 17-player campaign. I haven't played it since. Um, I gotta say, today's society, nowadays, Vampire seems a little more problematic. Um, I don't know if I would want to run games with some of those themes nowadays. If I did, it would definitely be, I'd, I'd have a very long session zero talking about what we wanted to do with the system, what we wanted to play out. Um, what we did with Vampire was never any of the shocks. Just like the, the, we didn't do a lot of horror when I ran Vampire. It was more politics. I did a lot of politics. I did a whole thing because you had Windsor and Detroit. I had that uh, Detroit was owned by the Sabat. Windsor was owned by the Camarilla. And the Sabat were trying to take over Windsor to, to own the border. Um, of course, because of where I live, the, the biggest threat was the werewolves of London, because how do you not? Uh, <laughs> That was a big part of the game, too. So it was more politics between the the, the Camarilla and the Sabat and and a, uh, the Werewolves of London being the external threat. So we didn't get into the human... Like, like humanity was a stat on the sheet, right? It wasn't really part of our game. We didn't get into the horror of it. it and I don't know if that's something I'd want to get into nowadays. There's an awful lot of uh, people upset with the new edition and happy with the new edition. I don't know doesn't really appeal to me now though i'll still dig the music and i'll still go to goth clubs but <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm no longer wearing the eyeshadow so i can't play vampire anymore yeah it's interesting it, it, i mean it looks like i'm just looking at the uh, modithius page it's their fifth edition and it looks like it's all the standard stuff chicago by night the camarilla handbook, well they brought and, it back yeah. so it, it had there was a new world of darkness where they had an end of the world and uh, they okay. rebooted everything and then people were kind of upset to get everyone back into it they they just rebooted with all these 20th anniversaries and stuff like that and the new additions bring it back to its roots so it's kind of back to where we started and so uh gaming and bs has, has joined us and uh, stated outright that mo does not own enough games oh i'm pretty sure i do <laughs> uh d is agreeing <laughs> with them but I, don't know. I, I, am, I am pretty sure I do. I need to get rid of some games. I'm not saying that I don't want some new games, but <laughs> I, I own way too many games. Uh, I definitely wore eyeshadow. I had big stomping boots with buckles. Yeah. I had a top hat. Kick uh, ass boots. I had, I had hair that went halfway down my back and a ponytail, and now I have almost no hair. I yeah. lost it all. But to that's be a honest, different story. The eyeshadow I only did like twice, like two or three times, maybe. I, I didn't tend to go with the makeup. Yeah, I no, didn't I... wear black bracers and a leather uh, fencer's hat and stuff like that. Uh, and yes, Jeff, from what I can see, these are uh, a new version of the original stuff with the Anarch cookbook, Chicago by Night. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's the old vampire in in new form. Yeah, like I said, they're they're definitely trying to trying to bring back the old audience, yeah. and they do the... very clearly have a mature content yes. warning at top yep. they, no question yeah it's it's definitely a very different yeah i just i i don't know i don't that playing in that world just doesn't i don't know uh, well, my brother my now. brother in law and my sister are playing in a weekly uh or in theory weekly uh vampire <laughs> game again so 
So in theory, <laughs> weekly. Yeah, there Lots, you go. Yeah. But I say it's, it's definitely there. Yeah. We don't we don't see people larping vampire downtown anymore. But no, no, the larping of vampire is probably subsided some. I'm sure there are still groups out there. Oh, I'm sure there are. It was. Uh, uh, now that that is one aspect of gaming I still have zero experience with. Yeah, no, like, I, like, I'm not counting ska, but there's like, a, that's there's, I mean, I, I'm still interested in um, the big one they do at uh, Breakout. Um, the yeah, big, that one sounds cool. Though, that one the, sounds really interesting. I'm not I interested. Can't yeah, I'm. I'm not interested in going out and and you know dressing up and swinging boffer swords. That doesn't really right. appeal to me. But uh, some of the the more interactive brain thinky uh, LARPs uh, that they do at cons do intrigue me. Yeah, yeah. There's the I can't remember what's called the breakout they do it. It's it's like a 18 hour or 12 hour or something LARP, and it's uh, if aliens are invading the Earth. And it's like a huge, it's like whatever, 50 people and some are on the alien side and some are on the human side and you play out this whole system. It, it looks fascinating. I just don't want to lose an entire day at a con to play it. Yeah, well, that's the problem, right? It's, it's you know, we're, we're there to do so much. Yes. So. That's, especially we're there to work, right? So. Yeah. All right, any other questions? So for those of you who joined the chat recently, I'd love to see the influx of new people. That's awesome. I see some new names in there and some names I know that I don't haven't seen too often in the chat. We are doing an AMA, so if you have a question, feel free Absolutely. to ask. Yeah, okay. I see like Eric Laz. That's not a name I recognize. Right, it's yeah. awesome to see Brent and Sean in the chat again. And this is uh, both uh, RPG and, and board games, card yeah, games, tabletop. obviously. <laughs> Anything tabletop. We're good Anything to talk tabletop. about. Yeah, Deanna really wants to try the um, Living Dungeon. They're, they're, from what I understand, it's it's a mix of dexterity games and, and uh, escape room type stuff with people in costume and stuff. It sounds really cool. I don't well, know. Well, I don't know. I, you, said, you said dexterity games, so I don't know. You might have just turned off ancient games. I don't know. No, I, I know uh, that at least one of, I know part of the, the real dungeon or whatever it's called, there's like a shuffleboard thing and that's how the fighter attacks. Right. So I know there's some elements of it, but I don't know a lot. I've never done it. Yeah, I know. I have to say, like, I, I've done some of the higher end uh, escape room stuff, and they are, they're fun. And there is some dexterity. Um, there was one where we, you know, we actually had to walk across a beam. Nothing, nothing really yeah. happened if you fell off, but it was easier to get past the lasers if you walked across a, a padded beam. Um, yes, True Dungeon, Ryan asked. I couldn't remember the name. I was trying to say Living Dungeon, but True Dungeon. Where you actually get like little tokens too, like there's a whole token economy. I don't know, it's it's weird where like people trade tokens and sell them on eBay and stuff. What I what turned me off on it was that it was a separate cost from your badge to play at Origin, like everything is, but it was a significant cost separate. So uh, here we go. Uh, when you run an RPG, how yes. do you keep your GM notes electronically or by hand? That implies that I keep notes when I'm GM. <laughs> uh, no, uh, by hand, still to this day. I, I, well, I can type. If I could sit at a computer, I could do it. I can type really quick, but I cannot type quick on a tablet or a phone. I just terrible on them. So if I had like a laptop, I would possibly start using notes. But no, I personally, I have a DM binder, and it's got typical like three ring line sheets in it, and that's how I keep my notes. Um, I definitely have always been pen and paper. That's actually how I make my notes when I prep too. I don't use I don't use anything digital. Uh, for a while, I was using oh I can't remember the name of the app. It's one that got discontinued on Apple, so I got screwed over actually because I paid for it and they discontinued it. Evernote. Uh, Evernote that might yeah. be it. And one of them. what it could do is you could open multiple tabs of the same PDF. So I would have like the combat system opened and the say the drowning rules and I would have the 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 prices for horses and overland movement open because I knew that was the stuff that was gonna happen during that game. And you could annotate it, which was awesome. So I had like I could quickly bring up encumbrance rules, say, and I would annotate encumbrance rules and I could literally tap encumbrance and it would bring me to the page. So I tried that and it worked great for the one game I spent the time to do it on. But then shortly thereafter, I just went back to flipping through the book and trying to remember where stuff was and putting post-it notes in my hardcover books. <laughs> and all it was was it was uh, Marvel superheroes is actually what I was running at the time. Yeah, I know I said encumbrance and stuff. It doesn't have that, but you get the point. Um, 
so I was running a Marvel heroic role playing for Margaret Weiss because I had the PDF that Cam Banks sent me. So I had annotated it on. It was really cool. And it worked, but I just, I find pen and paper easier. And I literally sit there with the same binder and the rule books and whatever supplementary material here on my desk in front of me. Or I, actually, I prefer to prep at a coffee shop. I don't know. I've always done that going back to my teens. I, I like to game prep at coffee shops and I make like physical notes. So, yeah, it's interesting. I actually still use the same binder I used back when we were in, wow. in high school and university. Uh, it's a zip up three ring binder that holds because yeah. it, it can hold my dice, my pencils, mm -hmm. my, and that was my, yeah. you know, if I needed to go role playing, I could grab that one thing and it had all my role playing stuff except for books. Um, yeah. So it was, if you see, it was fantastic. If, if you see me at a con, I've got it. And it's something that I originally bought when I bought the Will Builder's Guidebook for AD&D Second Edition. And it was the book I was going to use to put my homebrew world in. And it's the same book. I think it's the same booklet. So. Yeah, so mine's probably a little bit newer than yours, but not by much. Yeah. But it holds pencils. And the other thing is for, for business purposes, it holds my business cards and it holds my, uh, my uh, not my HSL sheet. I'm saying the wrong word, my numbers. So that if I do meet up with someone and I want a review copy, I can go, hey, 1.6 million people saw my tweets in the last 30 days. Yes, that's right. It's not quite a trapper keeper, but very close. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Prospero Hall, I guess their Trapper Keeper game is pretty good. Oh, God, really? Yep, they have a Trapper Keeper game with three different covers, including the Unicorn. That oh, was wow. all of the, the rage when we were kids. Wow. One sheet, that's the word I can never remember. I did i did catch a review of uh, the... Uh, um, Top Gun? Uh, Top Gun game, yes. That's... Uh, I think I'll pass on that one, volleyball included. Yeah, that one <laughs> sounded a little rough. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, they're jumping on the Top Gun marketing because it's a Top Gun release year, right? The new movie's coming out, but it doesn't, I, the, I actually, that's not true. The, 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 they have some interesting mechanics in the flight system, from the looks of it. Uh, the okay. actual, the actual dogfighting, there's mm -hmm. some interesting mechanics in there. Uh, they have actually included elevation. Oh, okay. So similar to what happened with that BSG game you ran into at uh, yep, Origins yep. last year, they have done elevation, uh, and there are some. Uh, you know, it's template. It's template based, but I, I think the volleyball game actually may have killed it. Um, but it's mm. and, and it's it's something you could house rule around probably. But yeah, it, but I yeah that was that was almost our topic for tonight. <laughs> I might save that for two weeks from now. Right. I know host rules and board games don't belong together, in my opinion. No, I don't disagree with you, especially knowing there are five thousand board games coming out. Why would exactly. you want to? Why would you want to use one that you had to host rule? Yeah. Yep. So yeah, when we we do have that thought, that was going to be our topic until Sean reminded me it was an AMA tonight. <laughs> Surprise! Yeah, I totally missed that. I, I had actually started prep on the other topic anyway. <laughs> Speaking of which, I don't know how long we've we been at this. Do we need to call it, or are we going to do a couple more questions? Well, I was waiting to see if a couple more came in. We could have done a couple more minutes because we don't have too too much later on. Um, yeah, we got it. It's a, it's a shorter second half yeah. of the show this week. So I, I, I'm, my my stopwatch didn't. I forgot to start start it, but I have been keeping on. I know when we started, so and okay. we haven't had any major glitches this week. So I, I see a bunch of people talking about microscope, which is kind of neat. I do own a copy of microscope, so Deanna, if you did want to try it, I do have it. The problem with Microscope is that it is 100% uh, improv play. So you're putting out cards for different scenes, and then your group, as a group, go, I wanted to, I want to delve into this further, and then you start breaking it down further, and then you go, I want to play out this scene, and you literally just start playing, right? Like there's, there, there's no, like your prompts are right there. Uh, there's basically almost no rules. There's just basically a little system about, uh, from what I remember, it's it's like who who and ending the situation favorably or not. And it's like, okay, you're playing whatever. We're we're developing a Roman civilization, and we zoom in and we're like, okay, there's this point where the Caesar decides to go to war, and do the does the country go to war or not? And someone goes, oh, that sounds cool. Let's play that out. Okay, well, you're Caesar, you're the lead general, and you're the 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 priest. Go. Right, like that's literally how improv it is. So I didn't think that would interest Deanna at all. I to me, it's like playing a protocol game. It's it seems cool. I don't know. I have it. I read it. I don't know when I'd play it or who I'd play it with. 
Yeah, that's an interesting one. I hadn't run into that before. I'm just sort of flipping through the... Uh... Uh, the, the, the end result is basically a big timeline of index cards, right? right. That, that gives you a whole system, right? Like, it seems really cool for do that and then play the game in the world you've made. I don't know. Like that That's a level of improv that I'm only just getting comfortable with now. <laughs> right. Well, to be honest. A, there's an ex, uh, expansion or a yeah, supplement. Kingdom. Uh, no, no. Uh, Microscope oh. Explorer. Which uh, is apparently know. tools and strategies to get the most out of your microscope okay. experiences. Fair. So for people who aren't quite grasping it or, or need a little help yeah. to to do things. Um, See, I know, I know they did a follow up too called Kingdom, which I don't own. I know like the the designer did a, a follow up game called Kingdom. Oh yes, which yes. I think is for developing a kingdom. And it, there's also something called Follow. So there there are three games: are Microscope, Kingdom, okay. and Follow. I don't know follow at all. Yeah, see, Deanna's like, no improv, no pass the stick, right? <laughs> like, I don't think she'd like microscope at all. Yeah. <laughs> like, maybe if you never zoomed in that close, if you never got to the role-playing part, she'd probably enjoy the world-building aspects. But when you get to that, let's zoom in and see what happened now. Right. I don't think it would go well. I want to get a copy for the Queen, to be honest. That's that's on my... I need to get a copy of that game. I think D would actually enjoy it. It'd be, I think it's a great game for getting people used to that style of play. I think it's an awesome intro to that style of world building. Oh, there we go. Kingdom is somewhat different. Uh, Jeff's saying it's a little more complicated to play than Microscope. Yeah, it seemed interesting. The, the fact that I never used Microscope is part of what made me not grab Kingdom. But yeah, for the queen is definitely on my pickup list at some point. That's one of those. Maybe maybe uh, CG Realm will get a copy in someday, and I'll see it on the shelf, and I'll buy it as an impulse, or it's something I'll, I'll bring from uh, something I might be able to get from Origins. Though so they're pretty indie press. Uh, Evil Hat. I don't know if Evil Hat does review copies or not, but it's something. It, it, it's not a high cost. It might be something I pick up. For the drama, I don't know that one. It is a web-based sort of concept of For the Queen. That's okay. Made yeah, with I'm a bunch just of games. looking at it right now. Yeah. I got to admit, everyone I played for the for the Queen with has already. You like by the time you play it once, you reskin it. Someone at the table when you sit down and four of you play for the Queen, one of you at the end is going to be like, "No, it'd be cool as if we did Star Wars or something." Right. Like every time I played it, every time I see it played, every time I watched an actual play. That comes up at some point where someone's like, oh, what if this was sci-fi? Or, oh, what if this was this? Or, oh, what if they were an all-girl band? And, <laughs> like, so it's definitely something that seems to be easily reskinned. Yeah, they've got, you know, for for our beloved leader. And yes. Around the, for the commune. For the promised land. Oh, it's on Roll20. That's interesting. Oh. I don't have Roll20. Do you have to pay Roll20 to be able to use it, like, to play? I know, I know there is paid versions. I, yeah, I'm I'm I don't know. I don't know what the field. limit is. I think I... I think I knew last year after our uh, I sat through yeah. that uh, session at, uh, but it has escaped me at this point. <laughs> this game would be great if it was about cheese. Well, everything's great about cheese. It's just like cheese and bacon. <laughs> what else? What can go wrong? You said the c word. Uh, I'm I'm way behind on some stuff, some podcasts and they're going on about stuff. Can buy for the queen for about eight dollars. Okay, but do you have to? You don't have to buy roll twenty. I'm just thinking that's something we could do over online. That could be interesting because it's a talking game. You're, there's no maps. There's no minis. There's right. no, you know, nothing you need to see except the cards. Right. That'd be something interesting to live stream sometime. Like the three of us could play. We'll, we'll see how D does with making stuff up on the top of her head. Right. right. She's got better at it medium, so <laughs> she's now a pro. She's no, she's not no longer saying yes randomly. No, no. I'm the one that did last game. I, I don't know if it, that was on our Gloomhaven live stream the other day where I sat there and I, I had the perfect answer. So we put up, we put up the cards and I'm trying to remember what it was. It was, uh, broom and something broom and job. Right. So D puts down broom and I'm looking at my hand and I see job and I'm like, Oh, perfect. Who uses a broom for the job? It's a janitor. This is perfect. She's totally going to say janitor. And then I put the card down and instead of saying job, I said janitor. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was, that was not good. Oops. Like, Oh no, we fail. <laughs> so it, it's not just Deanna that has brain farts while playing medium. Speaking of medium. No, actually we're going to say it soon in the announcement section. Anyway, I won't bother. Cause that's like literally the next session. Yep. Oh yeah. I said it with authority. I was like, janitor. 
Because you knew that's what you wanted to say. Exactly. Yeah. That was what I wanted to say. I, I played the head. It was it was tactics. Alrighty. I think we're good. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It was a great chat tonight. It took a bit to get some of the questions going. But you are literally, right now, the most full our chat room has ever been without a raid. So, actually, I think it's the fullest we've ever been even with, with a, a raid. raid. <laughs> I think even with a raid. So, that is awesome. I love seeing everyone out tonight. Thank you very much for your questions. We do this the last Wednesday of every month. So, you can come back for our next AMA on the 25th of March. But in between, stop by every Wednesday where we answer your Game and Game Night questions. And we're not done yet. Yeah. If you've got a question for us that we didn't cover today, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We like to keep growing with the support of fans like you. So please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more all the time. Always something new in the work. So now's the time to get in on the ground floor. At some point, we're going to stop changing things and just like hit a spot where we're happy with where everything is. Yeah, but uh, I like the ground floor line. Uh, okay, <laughs> we got to keep the ground floor line. The ground floor, the lobby. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, videos, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on a spot in the sidebar. Yeah, there's a spot. It's, it's a little further down now. We re rearranged our sidebar, but it's still there. All right, uh, we are still talking about our new improved Patreon. It's been going really well. This week, we're going to continue to take a look at one of the various tiers we have to offer. This week, we're looking at the This Chair is for You level. At this level, you get to play games with us. Each month, we're going to sit down and play a game with one of the patrons at this level. In most cases, this is going to be an online game, but if we're going to be at the same con or if you're going to be in the Windsor area, we'd love to make it a face-to-face -face game. We actually had our first patron game night a week ago Sunday where we played a game of Terra Mystica with patron John Carney, and it was a great time. Oh, I agree. That was a fun game. John's actually in our chat right now. I wasn't expecting to be here when I wrote this. <laughs> so good to see you, John. I think John had a great time as well. Now, besides getting to game with us, Patreon, Patrons at this level also get all the stuff from the previous level, and there's a lot of it. It includes the option to receive our Hot Tales newsletter, access to our patron-only polls, five bonus entries in any contest we have, like our Medium giveaway. Bonus audio recorded during our live show, uh, and uh, the, but cut from the podcast. The questions bumped up to the top of the questions list, access to our pre-production show notes, an account on our private Discord channel, and access to patron-only blog posts. So head over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and let us reserve a chair for you. All right, I just mentioned it. Our medium giveaway is going strong and launched a week ago today and will run for two more weeks until March the 11th, where we'll announce the winners right here on our live show on Twitch. We're giving away two copies of Medium, the mind reading party game from Greater Than Games and Storm Chaser Games. This contest will be open to anyone in Canada and the U.S. Breakout Con will be happening March 20th to the 22nd at the Sheridan Center in downtown Toronto, and all three of us, the entire Bellhop team, will be there. Join us at one of the country's fastest-growing tabletop gaming conventions, featuring a massive board game library, an amazing selection of popular independent role-playing games, uh, diverse panels, and one of the most impressive guest lists you will ever see. And they're still announcing more guests. The Proto TO announcement went out. So Proto TO is going to be there again this year. So that's pretty cool. I'm trying to get uh, patron Roger Malosh to get his butt up there so he can start showing off his games. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, find out more at breakout breakoutcon.com. All right. So it's been a week since our partnership with Mediavine was finalized and ads started appearing on the tabletopbellhop.com webpage. And so far, I haven't heard any complaints. Well, here's hoping no news is good news. Now, as I mentioned last week, this wasn't a step we wanted to take, and I hope people see it as a necessary evil that lets me keep doing this whole bellhop thing and produce the amount of amount and quality of content that we're putting out now. 
We're still open to feedback regarding this, so if you do see an ad that plays audio without you specifically unmuting it or find an ad that's offensive, please hit the report ad button at the bottom of the ad block. Yeah, more than anything else, we don't want to offend or upset anyone, and reporting offending ads will help with that. I know I have reported a few of them myself. And above all else, if you just see, think that there's too many for some reason, uh, it depends how many you see seems to depend on a variety of factors. Uh, but if you turn off your ad blocker and take a look and see if there's uh, too many ads or if it's just the right number, it would be nice if you whitelisted us on the, uh, on, on the site. Yeah, we do appreciate that, though. I don't know if everyone's as, as uh, ad block uh, crazy as Sean is. Possibly. Some, well, some browsers are now doing it automatically. So Yeah, that's true. That's true. Up next, a review of the extermination expansion for Horizons. All right, so the last time we talked about Horizons, we were joined in our chat room here on Twitch by the designer himself, Levi Mo, which was pretty awesome. By the end of the interview, uh, or the topic, Levi got in touch with me and offered to send me a copy of Extermination for me to review, which of course I agreed to, and that's where the copy I'm talking about today came from, and the concept of full disclosure. This platform has been great for interaction, the kind you don't normally get in the podcast format, outside of a live show in front of an audience. Yeah, tonight being a perfect example of that with a very crowded lobby, it's awesome. So Horizons Extermination was designed by Levi Mo, uh, features art by Mihailo Dimitrevsky, better known as Miko, was published in 2019 by Daily Magic Games. Now it is worth noting that this pack was, was included in the original Kickstarter version of Horizons and it is available separately for people like me who have the retail version of Horizons. You gotta buy them separate, which is what I didn't do because I have a review copy, but what I have the retail version, not the Kickstarter version. If you wanna see what comes in this expansion pack, head over to YouTube and check out our unboxing video. For those who haven't had a chance to watch that yet, what do you get in Extermination? All right, so the first thing that came out, because I opened up this little, it's a small card pack and I kind of shook it. The first thing that came out was a folded rule sheet. Uh, it's two-sided, glossy, really nice large font, which I greatly appreciate. Uh, easy to read even with my old eyes. The rules were followed by a sealed pack of cards and a plastic baggie with some tiles in it. Now this was cool to see because the tiles were actually pre-punched, so that was neat. I expected to see punch boards if there was gonna be anything to be punched. Uh, the tiles are alternate sun star tiles. Um, getting back to the cards, there were five new starter allies, one for each of the original species from the game, and then five new Viliox allies that are added to the original ally decks. One new card for each deck. And that's it. Like I said, pretty small box. Sometimes it doesn't take much to improve a game. But what does Extermination add to Horizons? So getting back to that podcast where we were talking about Horizons, uh, that was episode 61, Gateway to Area Control, if anyone wants to check that out. Now, I didn't know Levi was in the chat when I started the review. And while my review was mostly positive, I did feel the game lacked punch and that it was just, it was missing something. Now, one of the things I found missing is that everyone and everything online and everything about Horizons is talking about how it's a 4X game, how you get the feel of a 4X game in only an hour. But when I played it only featured three X. You could explore, you could exploit, and there was definitely expansion, but there was no extermination. So when I mentioned this in the, in the, during the review, Levi spoke up in the chat and asked, do you own the expansion? And I'm like, no, I didn't even know there was an expansion. That expansion, of course, being this expansion, which is of course called extermination, which of course adds that last X that I found missing in Horizons. So he basically said, you don't have a full game without having this expansion and strongly suggested giving the game another chance after trying it. And well, that's why we're here now is I got a copy of Extermination and gave the game another chance. So no longer a triple X game, we now have all four X's. And for our topic on problematic, potentially problematic content, see episode I don't know, uh, <laughs> not that kind of X's. Uh, 4X is in Explore, Exterminate, Expand, and Exploit. Uh, the Extermination Expansion Pack actually has three different modules that can be used together or separately. This seems to be an ongoing trend. Almost every, every expansion we've talked about lately seems to be done this way, and I dig it. 
Uh, the first module is six new stars or suns. To use these at the start of the game, you just mix these suns with the suns from the base game and then have each player draw one randomly out of the bag. And this way you should end up with a mix of the original suns, which do nothing special. They're just there as a, a, a basically a placement where you, excuse me, where you place other tiles around. Um, and the new suns. And while each of these new suns breaks the game rules in some way. So, for example, there's a sun that only allows certain types of planets around them. There are suns that limit the number of planets. So instead of holding six, they only hold four. Uh, there's a sun that causes your metal production to double. And there's another one that your energy production doubles. And then finally, I think the last one is one that makes um, colonies worth more on each of the planets around that sun. So this is a big deal as it could potentially really change your ability yeah. to score some of the mission cards. Yeah, it, it's, it's a significant change, but not it still has the same feel. It's cool. The second module is a set of new starter allies. Now, when you start the game, you give everyone a standard starter ally. That, that, that's from the base game, but now you also give them a random alien from this new set. Players then pick which one they want to use. And what's neat here is there's one of each of the alien types that are in the later allies in the other part of the game. So there's an ally for each of the different five player actions. So it starts off so that every player, if they use this new ally, is going to have a little bit of a bump in that particular action. So a little more variety and potential asymmetry to kick the game off, though this does obviously benefit players with more playtime and strategies in mind. Yeah, definitely true. And that's something I've seen of my plays recently. So what I've done is when playing with players who are uh, mixed experience, I just tell the new players, stick with the original human ally. Now, the final module is the one that adds the fourth X, extermination to the game. And this is a new set of five. They're called Viliox aliens. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, Diana likes to call them Space Deadpool because they're red and black. And they're also, uh, some, someone else called them Elithids because they got the whole Cthulhu tentacle thing going on. Now, there's one Viliox for each of the existing allied decks, so one for each of the different player actions. And these new aliens just get shuffled in with those. Now, each of these features some form of player versus player style action or ability. One lets you replace an opponent's collector with one of your own. Another causes opponents to discard missions. There's even one that lets you terraform a planet, which literally flips the tile over and destroys everything on it. Now, every single one of these new powers comes with a significant cost to offset their pretty nasty nature. Now, most of these cost at least 10 resources to use or cost knowledge, and knowledge in this game are victory points. Now, and this seems like a huge deal to me, as when I played, you would tend to system hop. If things were going against you somewhere and, and you were losing the area, you'd just shift focus off to another uh, mm -hmm. area. Whereas now you have a chance for a price to deal a blow against your opponents mm -hmm. and have a chance to regain a system that in the previous version was lost to you. Yeah, it, it significantly changes the feel of the game. Now, I think it's pretty clear in my original review, if you go back and listen to that, I think you probably even tell it my voice at the beginning of this interview, I didn't love Horizons. It's a good game. It's a very solid game. It even has some interesting new mechanics I've never seen before, which I always love, with the way the aliens work and how you build your little alien tableau to key off your actions. It's very neat. And I've enjoyed the game every time I played it. And I wouldn't say no if someone came out and said, hey, can you teach me Horizons? Or if they brought their copy and wanted to play it. But it just wasn't great. In a world with 5,000 new games coming out each year, games really need to have something, a wow factor, a je ne sais quoi, that makes them stand out from the crowd, and Horizons just didn't have that. Now, as a sci-fi fan, now I've only tried it once myself. I really did enjoy it, mm. but there was one aspect of it that was problematic for me, and it actually wasn't the lack of, lack of extermination. Yeah. But for you, does extermination add that wow factor to Horizons? At this point, I'd say it does. Like, it makes Horizons a significantly better game. Uh, it's much, I've much more enjoyed my plays of Horizons since adding Extermination to my set. Games have been tighter, player interaction is greatly increased, and the replayability is even up there with the new asymmetry and the new suns changing up the, the board setup at the start of every game. Now, as Levi and the name of the expansion indicate, this really does add that fourth X it, it, that was missing. The Viliox extermination, it's right there in the name of the box and it's right there in the gameplay. But I also like the other additions. The Suns in particular are a welcome addition. They make each game feel different and more interesting. 
And as Sean noted earlier, they can make some of the missions easier to accomplish. And of course, I love the new starter allies because anyone who listens to this podcast or who reads my blog knows I love asymmetry and anything adding more asymmetry to a game is pretty much a thumbs up from me. No surprise there to our regulars. <laughs> now, Horizons does not fix everything, though, because my one of my biggest complaints about Horizons is the mission cards and what they're worth compared to what you need to do to score them. And there is nothing in this expansion that fixes that. Overlooking a problem that this expansion isn't designed to address, because there's nothing in here to talk about the mission cards, I have to say that this is an excellent expansion pack for Horizons. I would go so far to say it's a must-have expansion. Like, it improves the game so much that Daily Magic should just do what they did with the Kickstarter and bundle them together. If you buy Horizons, you get it. Up the price by five bucks or whatever it takes to offset the, the loss and just sell them together. Yep. No, absolutely. And I, I suspect they didn't for uh, for reasons we'll, we'll touch off in a moment. But for me, uh, even with this new expansion, and I, and I agree, I think this really does add some, some nice content to it. Uh, the fact of the mission cards still keeps this game from being something that I just really want to have on my table. Right. Yeah, I actually think what I would love to see, and I was kind of hoping Levi would join the chat tonight, or hopefully he listens to this at some point, is I would love to see a replacement pack of mission cards. I noted that on the blog post too. I'm like, that's what I would like more than this extermination, is give me a set of rebalanced mission cards, because every game I played with it, someone has pointed out a card that made no sense to them. And it, it, it is one of the things keeping this game down. Now, there is one other thing I do want to warn people, though. If your group does not like player versus player conflict, if they don't like that style of take that player interaction, you're not going to like these Billy Axe cards. One player I played with absolutely hated them, like almost walked away from the game. They loved everything else about the expansion. They loved the new Suns. They loved the new starter allies. They're actually really in favor of having um, direction at the beginning of the game. They really liked being able to specialize something. But he's the type of player who doesn't like games where you can betray each other or backstab each other. And this is something that expansion is designed to add to the game. So if you don't like that, you're probably not going to want to use the Viliox. Overall, though, I strongly recommend picking up Extermination, just in general. If you like Horizons, this is a no-brainer. Go out and get it. If, if you like Horizons that much, maybe you back the Kickstarter and already have it. Great. But if you don't find this, it's, it's available dirt cheap, surprisingly, right now. Now, if you're like me and thought Horizons was good, but missing something, I think it's worth picking up Extermination and seeing if it kicks the game up a notch for you as it did for me. Now, if you don't like Horizons at all, I don't think this is going to fix the game for you. If you weren't a fan of the original, this isn't going to somehow magically make it better. Now, if you've never played Horizons, I actually do recommend picking up both at once. Uh, especially at the prices they are on online stores right now, is go get a copy of Horizons, grab Extermination at the same time, and use those new rules right from the start. Just if you hate PvP, if your group doesn't like that in-your-face conflict, maybe just use the new Suns and the new Allies. All right, well, for a slightly more in-depth look at Horizons Extermination, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com and just click on Reviews. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. So Friday night, Gloomhaven. Don't worry, no spoilers. You don't have to turn the podcast off. You don't need to skip ahead. Uh, we're not going to say anything that's going to spoil anything here. So Friday night wasn't quite the big deal we thought it was going to be. Um, though it was probably our most spoiler-filled episode ever. We were doing a side quest that's only unlocked by a personal quest, and we thought it was going to lead to a character retirement, but yet instead just led to another scenario. Now, I will say it's a fun scenario, and we did pretty well. Now, what I do want to know, know for people who don't mind spoilers is every time we release one of these uh, actual plays on YouTube, I do do a short blog post with some of my thoughts. You can find those over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just mouse over the section at the top that says videos and select actual play. We had been so hopeful about the results of this scene. And even though I think it was a really interesting scenario, I, even as a viewer, uh, it ended up being disappointing to those following along and really hoping to see yeah. the resolution that we thought we'd been promised. Yeah, it's, 
it's just never ending. It feels like sometimes, <laughs> especially for one person in particular. Yes, yes. Uh, then Saturday afternoon was our big medium demo day and giveaway at CG Realm. Um, I was doing demos of medium at the store. Everyone I taught medium to seemed to love it. Though I will officially say, if you have more than four people split into two groups, don't try to get everyone together. Uh, we didn't try eight players, but we did try seven players. And we definitely had people drifting away and getting distracted between turns. Yeah, and I think that's generally in line with what we've expected to see from this game. Yeah. Uh, it does have a sweet spot, or in a party environment where people cannot <sighs> worry about distractions and outside uh, outside of their turns, and can just be turning and talking to other people and ignoring what is going on. Yeah. That might be all right for the bigger groups, but uh, you know, that's that's uh, you know, generally speaking, what? keep it under five or under. I think. Yeah, and what we found was the people talking to each other were distracting the people trying to play because you weren't getting up and going away. So even with that, it was, it just just wasn't wasn't optimal. Now, what I actually suggest doing, this is something Deanna pointed out, that is, that is a pretty good call with this game, is that because you get fifteen different decks in the game, you could split up. Like we had a group of seven, we would have been better off to split into a group of three, three and four. And there's no reason you couldn't just use the base box to split it up. Now, the only thing you're losing out on is the three crystals, like the three broken crystal balls for how the game ends. But really, all that matters is that final one and when it comes up. So I would just suggest split your crystal balls so you only shuffle one into the bottom third of the deck. Like, you don't get that suspense of it slowly drawing the end game, but I mechanically, it should work out the same. So congratulations to Sebastian Gaspar Woods, who ended up winning the giveaway live in Windsor. Now, Medium wasn't the only game played at the event. Um, I also got to try Goris Maximus with six players, and I think we may have found a sweet spot. Even Deanna really enjoyed this trick-taking game with six players, and she's had really mixed reviews of it so far, uh, what she thinks and what she and she's been on the fence and I, she definitely was like wow i really enjoyed it this time so that was cool now the reason i think it's a sweet spot is that with six players the highest card in each suit which is the 13 is a minus two point card which makes for some really devious play with with and not people not wanting to swap trump as often as they might have where if that top card was either no points or positive points yeah and it's interesting because i mean that, that's a big difference from even just the five point with the five yeah. player which we enjoyed last time a lot uh, but that uh, twelve card was uh, plus one. Yeah. So you were you were winning in two ways, really. When you if you drop that high, yeah, that high card. Like I said, with that the highest card, the the one that's going to take the trick most times, being negative points, really seemed to like I said. I think that's a sweet spot. There was a lot more playing bad cards on other players. A lot of uh, uh, tech was playing with us, who's not in the chat room today, but often is. And man, I think Tech was taking me seriously from last week when I said I, I, I hate Tech because, I man, I was handing him so many negative cards, I felt bad. It was a lot of fun, though. Like, I really enjoyed playing it with six. I'm still looking for it. At some point, I'm going to try this game with seven and eight players. I may end up doing the review before I get to those player counts because it's just hard to get eight people together to play a trick-taking <laughs> game. It's just not an easy thing to do. So that might be coming up. But overall, I am really enjoying Goris Maximus. The more I play it, the more I'm enjoying it. I've definitely gotten into a groove. Like, I, I, everyone knows the rules, right? So you get that whole, I don't know, when you're playing Euchre, it's just you can almost have another conversation while playing because some plays are pretty obvious. Now, what I do want to bring up, though, is the art. And yes, we've complained about the art. And yes, I still wish it was not so over the top. Mainly because I could play this game with my kids, except for that art. And this isn't me trying to be a helicopter parent. My kids hate the sight of blood. They hate gore. And they will not. Like, this game would give them nightmares. So there's no way I'm going to play this. But Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, pointed it out first. And I now find he's totally right. Once you start playing, you stop looking at the art. All you're focusing on is those numbers in the top left corner of your cards and your fanned cards anyway. So the only card you're seeing is the one that's on top. You don't even notice the bear belching innards out into the sands of the arena once you get into the groove of playing. No, absolutely. And I noticed the same thing while I was down. Uh, it, you really don't notice it until, you know, after the, when the hand's done, as you're raking in, you'll yeah. usually start looking at them. But when, when you're, you're actually, adding up your points. Yeah, when you've got the cards in your hand, it's, you don't have no idea what's on them. 
Yeah, I just, I get it. It's called Gorus Maximus. I get the shock factor. I just, I, I almost want a kid-friendly version because I could play this with my family. All right, last game of the week for me. It's not an overly busy week, which a five-player game of Horizons with Extermination. Now, this is the game where I had a player who didn't like the take deck nature. Up until that play, I was all for giving a perfectly shining review to, uh, to the expansion. But really, it is important for people to realize that there's that PvP element and not all groups like in-your-face confrontation like that. So I do have to thank Ian for pointing that out. It's something I probably would have overlooked if I didn't get him into that game. And that's one of the things I love about being able to play with multiple different groups at local events like we have here in Windsor. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually think, uh, you know, if I, if I, if I like the mission cards uh, and I were buying this to bring home, I would probably take out Extermination to play with the kids. Yeah, uh, because they wouldn't enjoy that. They wouldn't enjoy me beating me blowing up their, you know, their planets for, on them, right? Uh, and then throw it back in when I was playing with with adults to to give it make it the fuller uh, experience. Yeah, the one but, thing we did find with extermination too was it made the game longer, right? But that's intentional. That's part of the game. You no longer have that rush to the finish. So, yeah. so how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right, so this weekend's our first ever Leap Day gaming night. Uh, that's going to be here at my house, and I expect there will be some games and probably some beers and some thrice cooked gypsy sausage and cheese and pizza. And that's not the sausage and cheese on the pizza. That'll be in addition. And fun had by all. So that'll be coming on this coming weekend. Uh, and sadly, no major event for me. This uh, I'm not going to be able to get down. But hopefully, because we've got yet another long strike weekend, I can get some games in with the kids. Oh, see, we didn't have any strike coming up next week. Next I was actually week. supposed next to week have was a full week. Four day weekend, but they've they because of how the two how different well, yeah. levels did it, they they stopped one of the strikes. So I've only got a three day weekend, but see, it is we a only three had, day strike weekend. Wow. Well, see the one the we only had the one day one and that got canceled. But I know your kids go to a different board than ours. Yeah. Uh, after that, it is the first Saturday of the month. We got nothing local, no no events going on that I know of. So. Uh, I'm thinking maybe to try to get a, people together for an epic game night. I've been talking about big games for a while, event games, right? Playing long games. We were having a conversation with Kevin while we were playing Medium about getting those bigger, longer, epic games to the table and how I don't get to play long games all that often. So we might we might uh, do something like that. There's a couple things. Even if I can't get a group, Deanna and I are looking at possibly playing War of the Ring or finally getting Twilight Struggle off the uh, the pile of shame. Or we might invite some people over. I don't know which, but no big events going on. Uh, the week after that, we will be at the CG Realm. So for people tuning in, it'll be the 14th of March. We'll be at the CG Realm. The 21st of March will be at Easy Mode, and the 28th of March will be at the CG Realm. No specific plans at this point for what games will be featured, but always a good time. Love seeing local gamers out free, no charge, family-friendly. Bring your kids, bring your friends, bring your significant others. Now a quick shout-out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Wayne Humphrey, thanks, Star Wars guy. Roger Malosh, thank you. Zopi, thank you. David Miller Jr., thanks, math guy, Dave. Brian Kurtz, thanks, Brian. Disappeared just before we said his name again. <laughs> well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, and game on. on.